Hey everybody, it's Phil from One Wall Studio here, and today I'm going to be talking about and reviewing the usage of Drumforge Savior, which happens to be one of my favorite drum sampling programs that I've ever had the pleasure of using. Now, most people who know me know that I've actually been a Stephen Slate drummer guy for quite a while, and uh, once I got Drumforge Savior, that all changed. I've been using it for a lot of different projects, including solo work, uh, work I've done with bands, work I've done for friends of mine, and even just doing session drumming stuff like light work here and there. I've actually been rendering out uh, all of my samples from Drumforge Savior and sending it directly to the client with the MIDI file so that they can get a uh, rough translation, but they can also use the mix directly from it because honestly, I am in love with the drum sounds. So first, I'm going to be going through the process of uh, showing off some of the presets. I chose five. From the beginning, I chose the jazzy preset, the 90s rock preset, the tight, bright and clicky preset, which I think is pretty dope for punk. I chose the uh, Gentian natural preset for a section I labeled Thal, which uh, <laughs> is very fun. And I chose the death metal preset for the section I labeled heavy metal. So I have all of these options just chilling here. And I want to go through each of these presets first. Before I jump into how the program works in my typical style of going absurdly overboard with how everything goes. So first off, I have a section labeled Indie, which uses the uh, jazzy preset. So turn up those headphones, just kind of vibe out. Don't worry too much about the chords, but really feel and listen to the articulation on these drums. So let's give it a go. Now, one thing you'll notice is that there's some pretty light sizzle there. There's a lot of uh, gentle articulation on the hi-hats, and the snare and the kick are pretty punchy. Maybe more than you'd want for jazz, but honestly, I really like that vibe. I love how dark the hi-hats are. I like the crashes and the rides having kind of that, that sizzle, but that little bit of undertone of the body. And I like how warm they are overall. One thing I will say is that I feel as though the toms are really loud. And I feel like that's something I'm probably going to end up saying a lot. But out of the gate, using presets, the toms are very, very loud. Because look at how much that jumps right here. I actually used a, uh, a limiter to illustrate the point. Check it out. Like, it's way louder than everything else right off the bat. However, that's with 3 dB of gain reduction on the whole thing when the toms hit. So I feel like that's kind of a strange choice for the toms. However, I will say that the samples themselves sound great. Listen to some of that. They're all really tightly tuned and nice, and they have both a warmth to them and a punch to them, and I really appreciate that. I might not use that for actual jazz. In fact, for jazz, I tend to use the uh, the dry and thick or the big room one uh, kit variation or the vintage one kit variation. I tend to use those for actual jazz, but for indie rock and like more gentle stuff, this sounds great. So one thing I also really like about Drumforge Savior that's an addition to newer versions is you can really click on each individual thing, and when you think it should make a sound, it does. One thing I hate about drum samplers is that you don't always get a sound when you click something, and that's frustrating. You can click there, you can go to the carousel window and see what some of the microphones are and check out the attack, sustain, release curves of all of the samples. You can adjust velocity curves. You can adjust the samples that are actually loaded. So if you don't like sample seven of the hard velocity layer of the loose shaft articulation, you can get rid of that just by clicking on it and then it'll play every sample but that one.
but I actually quite like sample seven, so I'm going to keep that one. And while you're at it, you can actually do adjustments in here to all of the mics. You can change the type of mic you use for most of the samples. For the overheads, you can change the configuration. Uh, you can adjust the sub kick levels. And you can actually change certain parts of the configuration that are hard to find elsewhere. So like on the kick, you can change it from a wood beater to a felt beater, which might work better for the jazzy preset. Yeah, it really gives that wood feeling that, or that woolly feeling that I would expect from a jazz kit. You can also select different pitch variations and change the threshold for alternation of the samples if you wanted. So you could have it trigger different samples faster, slower, what have you. And one thing about uh, Drum Forge Savior that I particularly like is everything has a layer. Left hand, right hand, snare rim, snare side. Right hand, left hand. It's actually made me start to use the articulations on my uh, E kit because I think it's so cool to have that kind of variation in left hand, right hand. And I've heard it in other things before, things like Native Instruments Contact Studio Drummer. However, I don't like the drum sounds in that program. The other thing you'll notice is that while there's not a ton of sample layers for each layer, there is plenty enough for variation. And especially once you get into the, the softer layers, you can get to some really gentle, warm, soft vibes. So it could be that the reason the toms are so loud is just because of velocity issues on my part. I might have played them too hard. In fact, oh yeah, I played them like really hard every time I wanted to hit those toms. So maybe it's just me. Maybe I was just playing it harder. But honestly, I quite like the tom sounds at the lower articulations. With a little bit of MIDI editing, you should be able to find any amount of variation that you need because plenty of different layers to choose from and plenty of naturalness as well as exaggeratedness. So I'm a big fan of that. Also a big fan of the TRX symbols on display here. I've always been a big fan of TRX. Demonstration section two is the rock preset or specifically the 90s rock preset. So let's check this out, shall we? So right off the bat, you can tell that it's really punchy, really saturated, really aggressive. And that's because this particular preset actually has a few different options in the mixer channel, right? So first off, we've got a different set of drums. We have hi-hat four, China three, etc. which if you were to look at the references on the side, kick three is a vintage maple eight ply. And if you were to go into the carousel to see a lot more specific information, You'd see that it is a vintage maple eight ply with a re ring and it's 20 by 14. So you can get a lot of good information. On top of that, you can see that it's using the D112 and the SM7B for the inside and the beater kick. It's got a little bit of sub kick blended in, actually uses some mono room samples, which is cool, has an ORTF configuration in the overhead samples, and has very little room, which Rock and roll didn't really have a lot of room back in the day, especially the classic rock stuff. It was just you hooked up some close mics to a kit and you ran with it. So this has a lot more articulation than a lot of that earlier stuff when it comes to sample choice. But it's also already got some tape saturation on the snare and the shells and the cymbals and the master output of the whole thing. So there's tape saturation across all of this, just enough to make it feel classic, right? There's also some compression already going on in this preset by default on the snare, the kick, and the shells, and the cymbals. Now you'll notice that it's really easy across this area right here to choose what kind of processing 
you want to see on every single channel. And it really does help right off the bat. So I could see how each thing is EQ'd, if anything has clipping on it, if anything has a reverb send or like a send to a post fader bus or a pre fader bus or what have you. You can do all of that kind of routing here as well as just looking at the overview and seeing which channel has what kind of processing and then you can turn it on or off in the overview window. You can also do that up here right underneath the icons. And if you click on any of the icons, you can actually blend in samples. So I'm going to actually use this opportunity to set my sample library real quick to my drum shots library. And because it knows which ones are which being drum shots, you can actually add these samples in and blend them as much as you want. And then you can hit OK and boom, blend it in. What you can also do adjust the dynamics, have a gate if necessary, uh, adjust the pitch to blend it in with the pitch of the original sample, so on and so forth. But I'm actually going to get rid of that because I'm going to take this opportunity to analyze the direct drum sounds without the context of the mix. So again, huge toms. One thing you'll notice is that this one uses a lot of i5 and SM57, a little bit of M201 as the microphones on the top, and then there's got a little bit of bottom, a lot of overhead, plenty of room, and a little bit of far room sample for the snare, all of which is being sent from each of these channels into snare one, which is then being routed to the shells bus. And the shells bus is being routed to the master bus. However, it's not the actual master output. It's just the master bus right here on the mixer. So this is actually being sent to the output. And in this particular instance, I literally only have stereo outs for everything. I did that because I didn't want people to think that I was doing any kind of editing uh, at all other than a limiter to prevent peaking to adjust levels based on my own playing. Didn't want to have to do that. I just wanted it to be a straight out of the box experience and then also not have the people of YouTube's ears hurt when I play Tom's too loud. That's just the way it is. But you can notice that almost everything has individual faders that you can adjust in the mixer area and see if there's any kind of EQ or saturation done to the individual parts as well as to the bus that they're being sent to. So you'll notice that there's an EQ channel active on all of these. I don't know if there's anything done to them, but there's only processing done to the snare bus and then there's also processing being done to the shell bus and a little bit to the master bus. So you can really stack and mix these things as much as you want in the box, in the plugin, no less, and come out with a really good sounding two track output if you want to. Like there's some really usable sounds here, and especially with all of the opportunities for variation with the different cymbal types, the different kick, snare, room types, overhead configurations. This is like a tweaker's paradise, which I realize has a different meaning now that I've said that out loud. So now let's give the next preset an opportunity to shine. The metal preset, or as I like to call it, the death metal preset. But since I'm not very good at death metal drumming, I'm just going to play some regular old heavy metal. Not going to get too ahead of myself. Don't want to spoil the surprise for the next part. So one thing that I really like about this preset is that it is really bright and really clicky like death metal should be. There's something magical about that click and that like really triggered feel, which is ironic to say since we're triggering this whole thing with MIDI. One thing I like is that the kit size has grown proportionally to the past kit sizes. So now you have more options with crashes. 
Crash Ride, Splash, Crash, Splash 2, Bell Ride, Multiple Toms, a really nice snare, a Maple Poplar Aluminum Snare, what the heck? Aluminum Center Maple Poplar 14 by 6? That thing sounds nuts. And a really thin 22 inch maple ply, eight ply kick. That thing is pure click. Oh, I love it. Let's look at what kind of processing is being done on this. Tube saturation of the kick and tape saturation of the snare. Distortion on a parallel bus. Nice. Nothing on the shells. Tape saturation on the cymbals. Compression on everything. I kind of got uh, limp wristed right there at the end, so the snare didn't smack as hard. I guess I was still in the vibe for jazz at that point. <laughs> A little bit more of a jazzy little snare roll. But yeah, something you'll notice is that because you have a lot of routing options, you can actually do parallel compression, parallel EQ. You can do a lot of things in post on this. And I don't think there's any reverbs on this one. Right. But there are sends. And so you see the way that the shells are actually being sent to the parallel bus right here. And not the individual shells themselves because all the individual shells are already routed to the shells bus. So at that point, you might as well. You don't really need to tweak anything. And that parallel bus sounds pretty cool. A lot more natural without it, but really brings in some smack with it. I like that. Now that is a very traditional metal sound. I quite like that. I could hear that being used on a, a record with people who are like, I want it to sound true, Kvalt, but not so true, Kvalt, that like it's just completely a megaphone effect. You know, like if you really want a true Kvalt, you might as well just go. <laughs> ah, yes, true Kvalt. Anyhow, back to the real world, I'm going to go to the punk preset next, which is called the tight, bright and clicky preset. Now, just as a word of warning, you're going to have to reset your ears because this punk is bright, it's angry and it is unconventional and it's going to do everything it can to just kind of get on your nerves. It's punk. It's aggressive. Let's do this thing. Yeah, so it's raw, it's angry, it's aggressive, but I really, really like the pop on these drums. It just stands out so well. I can only guess that part of that is because it comes with a secret prototype kick drum that says 24 by 12, but it's actually extendable. So if you notice, it's got like a ring around it that you can use to pull out and expand the length of the drum. And I, I honestly have no idea why anybody would think to do that, but it's really cool. It's also got an out of phase sub kick, which is dope. Having an out of phase sub kick means that it's going to be pulling a little bit of that low end out and just focusing on that bright click and that punch. It's also using a 14 inch by four inch deep, which I don't know if technically it's a piccolo unless it's less long in diameter. But I do know that four inches deep, you've got like nothing but crack up there. So there's so much going on here. And also it's using all I-5 and no 57. If I were to do this, you'd probably get more low end. 
But as of right now, it's just all that punch, that click. And while we're at it, the toms are all maple. A lot of direct, not a lot of bottom. Looks like both toms are being mic'd with 414s instead of 441, so that's condenser. And the crashes are pretty bright. I just thought that that was really interesting. And everything just has this beautiful click to it. Like, it just sounds so good out of context. And then you throw it into a bright, angry context. It's still so good. I love it. Up next, I have what I called the stupidly progressive Genty and Natural preset. Now, just so you know, this is going to be so Genty and so Thal and progressive. It's basically going to be unlistenable because I don't care about making things listenable. I care about making it heavy. So one thing you might have noticed is that I literally did not care about making it listenable. I only cared about making it genty and progressive. So hence the stupidly progressive genre tag. The genty and natural preset, I actually really, really like. I did take a little bit of issue with it, though, in something that's extremely fixable. Hear how everything really pops? The kick is a little too low. Except for double kick sections. And I realize it's because there's still the ability for buildup to occur over repeated samples being triggered in the low end, which really brings forward the low end in a way that I would want to do naturally in a mix anyway. So I want it to have that fullness the whole time. And I realized the best way I could do that would probably be to actually just heck and clip the thing. Because then it's more consistent the whole time. But then we have the problem of me messing with a preset, and I don't want to do that. I just want it to be perfectly the same way that it was when it came, just to see how well it fits in the context of a mix. And personally, I think everything is audible. I think everything is well-tuned to being in this kind of environment with the Genty and Natural preset. I think it sounds great out of the box, but of course, there's always going to be variation in how people play things. And if you have a weak foot like I do, then the built-in groove engine is actually pretty cool. You can actually see that there's a lot of options for grooves. Heavy metal, death metal, black metal, power metal, gent. Are we still asking the question, does it gent? Because the answer to this would definitely be yes. <laughs> it sounds really good. It's really simple. You build the cue, you throw it together, you say, all right, I really like thrash metal and I like some gent and I like some... Uh, Tech death, and I like to have a fill that sounds like it was from a death, black, whatever. And then, boom, you put the fill in. It actually changes the last measure or two measures or however long the fill is of the beat before it so that it goes right into it.
So you see how you can tie them together any way you want. And if you don't, you just go to the little chain between them and boom, take. You can get rid of, but you can keep it tied. You get, there's a lot of options here. And even if I slur my words, I think you get the point. You click on the arrow, you take away from the previous groove. You click on it again, you give that back. And you can move these, you can push the fill to a previous boy, and then you can get rid of that measure, the final measure from that previous boy. A lot of options here, a lot of uh, tweakability if you'd like. You can also clear the queue, and you're pretty much golden. That's mostly what I can think of when it comes to the groove player. Really simple, very obvious. You can either host sync or you cannot host sync. Up to you. You know, it's your choice. But uh, at the end of the day, you're going to get a lot of options out of Drumforge Savior. I love this program. Now, one thing I will say is that I like the mapping. I like the ability to save and load maps and use tons of maps from other things. I like how you can literally take any of these and assign a specific MIDI note to them from the map, as opposed to having to find stuff and drag it down or go to this channel, specifically find what the MIDI note is, and then change that. All mapping is saved for the mapping screen, and that is wonderful. I wish more programs would focus on that because a lot of times it's just unnecessary buttons right off the bat, and uh, nobody likes to mess with those. I like the sheer amount of variety that you get with 12 different kicks. You've got 12 different snares. You've got eight different sets of toms, some of which have three pieces, some of which have two pieces, and there's a lot of variety there. I like how there's four hi-hats, all of which have very different sounds. You can get a bright, a dark, a medium bright, and you can get a limited edition hi-hat, which is really nice. I really like that limited hi-hat for times when I need something a little bit brighter. I also love that they have flat rides, bell rides, and crash rides as options. I like the fact that they have seven different regular crashes to choose from, ranging from very bright all the way to very dark like lightning bright to thunder dark, which need I say more? Those are great options. I like that there's a couple of Chinas to choose from and a lot of splashes. One thing I don't like about some drum programs is that they give you one or two splashes. But honestly, a splash is designed to give a drummer variety with accents and fills. So having more splashes is going to give you more opportunities for variation with fills than having a lot of Chinas will. And you just get this, uh, this pretty sound with a splash. It doesn't feel quite the same as the impact and the guttural response of a crash, which sustains forever. So sometimes I just want, and then I hit a China for maximal effect. But there's a lot of options here. The one thing that I will say is that I've loaded five different versions of the sampler right now. And so far, my memory usage is up to about 20.5 gigs out of 32 on this particular system. And if you look at the performance meter, you'll notice CPU usage is fantastic for the most part across the board. And in action, It actually doesn't take up that much more on my system, which is an old Ryzen 26, 2600X. Yeah, probably on my old system. It only goes up from about two and a half percent with all of the processing on that particular preset up to about three and a half, four percent CPU usage. So really, there's a lot of possibilities here. And with zero pre-delay compensation, it's zero latency. It's a great response. Uh, the only pre-delay compensation you see here is from the samples used by the limiters that I use on each channel just to prevent things from going astray and to have more uniform volume across the board. But there's a lot of power with these particular plugins, but they do take up a lot of memory. It actually takes up less memory with the more recent updates. I'm actually on the version 1.02, which has a lot more options for scaling. It has a lot more options for uh, limiting voices. If you want to reduce the amount of memory that's being used or the CPU that's being used, you can make a couple of different options like having the mouse wheel move knobs or faders or to reload certain defaults when you swap different presets, which is great. So I really like that. And it has a built in updater that you can launch once it's installed. You know, all of the options tonally 
processing in the box, all of the different ways you can do some cool routing, different reverb options. You can actually go for a whole bunch of different reverb options if you wanted to, although I haven't really touched on that in these presets. Uh, you can go with 80s tiled room, small room, mid room, large room, chamber, tunnel, cave and warehouse. And honestly, sometimes I just want to blend in a warehouse reverb for my snare during a breakdown. It sounds really cool, and you can then assign that to any of these groups. It's really simple. I love the options that we have here. There's a lot of creative possibilities. You can mix and match what kind of processing you're doing on every channel. You can get a feel for what the sound of the piece you're using is, no matter what screen you're on. So if you decide... You like that kick over here, but you just need to tweak it a little bit. You could solo it and play the track. You could mute everything but it to see where the space is for it in the kit overall right now. You can do any kind of saturation, compression, EQ, clipping, reverb. And while all of the options are kind of limited, so like this is only a four band EQ with one of them being a selectable notch, pass or shelf as well as the bottom one being a notch pass or shelf, you can still get a lot out of four bands of EQ and a compressor, which you can choose between fast and slow compression. You can choose to have a high pass on the side chain of each compressor. You can adjust the release and the ratio and the threshold. And honestly, they're some of the best sounding drum samples I've ever heard. What can I say? It's a drum sampler. It sounds great. It sounds great in most any context from jazzy. to rock. To metal. To punk. To stupidly progressive. But honestly, I think that Drum Forge Savior is, in fact, one of the best drum samplers that I've ever had the pleasure of using. And even if I've only used it for tracking something for the sake of MIDI to send to somebody, I just can't get over how great some of these drums sound. How awesome it is that I'm actually able to blend in an i5 instead of a 57, which the i5 is one of my favorite microphones of all time. And I feel like it's so versatile and you can use it on anything. And most of my presets. Let me actually pull up one of my presets right now. It's actually called the uh, Creating Me Kit, and it has by default all of my routing. So it has the snare samples, the shell pieces routed to the main snare, where I have the output three assigned to my snare track on my session. I have in my track template, I have the overheads sent to output one so you can hear that all of the overhead samples from every individual piece are actually being sent to output one And so if you've got the shells there, you can actually see where each of them are routed to. I have the high tom and the low tom sent to here and then bust outside of the program. And I have all the spot mics for the hi hat, the ride cymbals, the all the room tracks, the the far room samples and the room samples split. And as a result, I have a really easy bus I can open up and pull from because I saved the routing and I saved the preset here in the kit. It's really, really cool. And I love that fact that you can just save a preset. You can load one anytime you want and it'll save all of your routing. That makes life abundantly easy. <laughs> like I can't explain it enough. So let's see. Let me reset the MIDI mapping from my personal kit. So that's a kit that I built just playing around with kick four, 
which is the uh, birch eight ply because I love birch. I used snare 11, which is the oak popular poplar because I'm a big fan of oak. The toms are uh, also oak. And then all of the crashes are pretty bright. Except the hi-hat, which is dark, which is one of my favorite combinations. A really dark hi-hat doesn't get in the way of the bright crashes and has articulations that you can hear very easily in the room. That's one of my favorite combinations. Don't at me. So being able to build kits at my leisure, change them just by clicking on them like, oh, I don't want that Tom. I want this Tom, the maple acrylic hybrid Tom. Yeah, like that fits better. So I'm just going to keep that. Being able to switch anything at a moment's notice. Eh. That's nice, but... Oh, yeah, that's beefy. Being able to just audition things that quickly and save so much time, you don't even really need an audition button at that point. You can just swing through all of the possibilities in this carousel or while listening and moving here, you can switch it from this section. Like, I literally can't think of a bad sound that you can get out of these drums. Everything is chosen with a purpose. They're so unique because they're not like the other brands. It's not, you're not getting DW or Pearl or any of that. You're getting a boutique brand for the same price as a sampler that has all of the original brands, like all the OG things that people want. This has unique versions of every kind of drum you can think of made by a brand who just makes custom drums. And so everything sounds unique and interesting and has its own flavor that you're just not going to get out of other drum samplers where all they do is recreate the same old DW and Pearl and Tama and Yamaha and every single drum set that is in every other program. It's been done in other programs. This is unique. So beyond the cool ways of manipulating the sound, Beyond the ease of use, beyond all of that, the most impressive thing about this is that you're getting TRX cymbals, which are some of my favorite, and you're getting Savior drums, which you're not getting in any other program. These are extremely unique, and I don't think people really appreciate what kind of epic statement that that is, that Drumforge was able to secure a boutique brand that nobody else has been able to take samples of up to this point. It's just incredible. And honestly, the sounds are there. The workflow is there. The memory usage is a little bit high, but honestly, I've used more memory in contact just by having a whole bunch of orchestral stuff open. And if you're willing to go the extra mile and open, say, seven instances of Drumforge Savior, then yeah, you're probably going to be using all of that memory. But nobody's going to be using that much. Opening up just one or two instances of this drum set one for special effects and then maybe one for your main drum sound it's pretty decent on the memory usage and it's honestly got the best drum sounds out there i don't care what people say i shoot this out over easy drummer superior drummer any kind of drum sampling program out there and i will choose this one any day so i hope that helps i hope you guys have learned a lot and i hope that you guys were able to get all that you wanted out of it. There's a couple of features I didn't go over, like uh, the swap left right buttons on the channels, because really all they do is just reverse the channel. So you get the snare a little bit more in the right versus the left or the left versus the right. And that's cool that you can do that. But honestly, in my opinion, that's what panning is for. <laughs> Having the ability to pan on every channel it's kind of easier than swapping left, right in just the overhead and not the room or vice versa. It, Cause with a stereo image, I kind of get it, but like, is it super necessary? Probably not. It's cool that it's there. It's really not something that I ever use in real life application just because the samples are so good the way they are. I've never had an issue with them being too far to one side or the other that I couldn't just pan and put them where I wanted them to be. Uh, there's small stuff like that. There's really not much to talk about. Everything in this is so simple, so intuitive, and so easy to use. 
that there's really not much point in going over it any further. With that in mind, I hope that you got something out of this today because I can't help but gush over the quality of Drumforge Savior. And honestly, I use it in everything. Unless somebody specifically requests that I use a different sampler or a different samples, this is my go-to from now on. Anyhow, thank you very much for staying and listening. Uh, if you really like this video, comment, like, subscribe. My wife is always telling me, always be plug-in. So guess I have to do that. And now I get to show my channel to you who are watching my channel. So thank you very much. I'm Phil. Take it easy, everybody. I'll see you in the next video. I appreciate you.